Um, so we're rolling into the high holiday season, or I guess we sort of technically are in the high holiday season because we started the month of Elul last week. And it's supposed to be, or it's traditionally been sort of a uh, warm up for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur where people are investing energy and self-improvement and all kinds of other things. And it seemed like a good time to start to look at ideas that are related, Jewish ideas that are related to these same themes, um, but that are workable for humanistic Jews because not every Jewish ethical idea is gonna be workable for humanistic Jews. Not every text is gonna be workable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is sort of an opportunity to one, think about what even what we even mean when we talk about Jewish ethics or Jewish values. And then beyond that, um, thinking about um, what we're, what Musar, Musar, sorry, Ami, um, what Musar is as an ethical approach and why it might actually work for humanistic Jews when a lot of other Jewish ethical approaches don't. And we'll do this, it's text on Tuesday, and we'll do this through texts. And in the email I sent out with the link today, I said that there's a connection to Ben Franklin, and there is, and we will get to it today. It's actually a very interesting connection to Benjamin Franklin. Not that he was traveling in Eastern Europe and taught people stuff. I think it probably should point that out. So we'll talk about Jewish ethics and Musar. And, you know, I always kind of have goals at the beginning and the goals this time are understanding what we're talking about when we talk about Jewish ethics, thinking critically about the idea of Jewish values, because I think we use terms like Jewish values or humanistic values or secular humanistic Jewish values or whatever without putting a ton of thought into what we actually mean. And it's possible that when we actually think about that, we might come to some different conclusions about how we should talk about ethical values generally. Um, and then the final one, understanding, understanding at a basic level, and today will be the most basic of basic levels, what Musar is and how it can be used to make our lives better by helping us be better. Um, Musar is its own set of ethical disciplines. And so, and it's been in use as a, as a organized movement for about 150 years. So obviously we're just going to be touching on Musar over the next few weeks. Um, so we're kind of opening with the question of Jewish ethics, Jewish values. What are we talking about? What do they mean? How do they work? Where do they come from? And when you don't use a ton of terminological or, or intellectual discipline in deciding to talk about Jewish ethics or Jewish values, you get your stuff from all over the place. And there are lots of different chunks of literature that are Jewish ethical literature. So there's all kinds of things in the Bible that are called ethical works. The book of Proverbs is obviously one of them, um, but there are parts of Psalms, there are parts of the book of Ecclesiastes, a lot of Ecclesiastes, um, lots of bits of other books that involve thinking about ethics, thinking about what we're just going to say for now is the general idea of right and wrong behavior. Um, in the rabbinic texts, Lots of people know Pirkei Avot, which I'm calling Mishnah Avot because it's from the Mishnah and the name of it is Avot. Um, we know about Avot because there's lots of familiar sayings that are attributed to rabbis that are from Avot. Um, and then there's lots of stuff, just, just loose statements all over the Talmud. Um, I say Talmudim because there's a, the 
typical one that we mean when we say the Talmud is the Babylonian Talmud, but there's a, a Talmud of the land of Israel, Talmud Yerushalmi, sometimes called the Jerusalem Talmud. That's another source for some of these kinds of sayings. Um, and the Midrasha collections, you know, biblical interpretive works. Um, because all of Midrash is a loose thing anyway, and so you get all kinds of interesting statements about how people should behave. Um, in the medieval period, the kind of literature we have for Judaism expands a lot once we get to the medieval period. So we have um, legal codes and responds to literature, so letters asking specific questions of Jewish law, commentaries on biblical works, commentaries on the Talmud, commentaries on whatever, um, this is, it's the medieval period when studying a Jewish text stops being about studying just the text and starts, be, starts to be studying the text and everything around it on the page. So commentaries start here. Um, poetry. So we have lots and lots of poetry from this period of time, and some of them deal with ethical issues as well. Philosophical work. So obviously Maimonides and all of these other Jewish philosophers or Jewish thinkers, I'm not sure I'm convinced that we should call them Jewish philosophers, um, but the, their works also have ethical content to them. Um, there's a book, I've actually named specifically a book called Duties of the Heart. Uh, Duties of the Heart is important because it's probably the first work of literature that anybody calls a Musar text. Um, and so I've named it specifically because it is a collection of ethical maxims in addition to um, some very long conceptual discussions about theological issues and everything else. But Duties of the Heart is recognized as being the first piece of dedicated Musar literature. And then in the modern period, we have Musar movement literature. So that really starts in the 1840s. A work called the Tanya. Um, the Tanya is important not for us generally, but it is the text studied by Chabad Lubavitch. So in addition to the Talmud and the Torah and all kinds of other things, the Tanya is really a key piece of their organizing philosophy, and it happens to also be a Musar-oriented text. Um, there's continued medieval activity, there's modern philosophy, there's modern ethical works. So there are people at JTS, at Jewish Theological Seminary, who are ethicists, and they write stuff. And there are Orthodox scholars who write ethical literature. So there are all of these sources for ethics. Not all of them qualify as Musar. So we should probably talk about what Musar is. The Hebrew word Musar just means instruction, essentially. Um, and there's sort of a genre of literature that would be called Musar literature. And then there is an organized movement called the Musar movement. The way people learn to do Musar, the way that we'll talk about it, is really a result of the movement as much as it is the body of literature spanning at this point um, about a thousand years that we would call Musar literature, this kind of ethically ethical instruction literature. Um, so those are sort of the, the periods of time that we're looking at. Um, I left out, I, meant, I neglected to mention ethical wills. I actually have a couple of chunks of ethical wills in there because they are the most entertaining medieval ethical reading you will ever encounter. Um, and you'll see why in a moment. So just taking example kinds of ethical texts from the various eras, the biblical text in Proverbs, Proverbs all over the place is an ethical text and has this, this is just an example from early on. If you take to yourself my words and keep as treasure with you my commandments to listen attentively to wisdom and mind closely discernment. If you call out for understanding and cry out for discernment, 
If you seek it like silver and search for it like treasure, then you shall understand the fear of Yahweh and find knowledge of God. This idea is really, really important in the creation of the modern Musar movement. So we will come back around to it. Um, but just as an example, this is an example of an ethical statement. Um, and I'm pointing it out to you to make you start to think about what exactly do we mean by Jewish ethics. Um, another one, a vote if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Right. So this is this is Rabbi Hillel. Lots and lots of people know this. Um, there's a millennial-oriented Jewish organization. If not now working on Israel-Palestine issues. They're the ones who chain themselves to the DC Convention Center doors when AIPAC is in town. Um, so they've named themselves after this statement by Hillel. Um, Hillel also said, this is the one right before it, one who does not make his name great causes his name to be destroyed. One who does not add to his knowledge decreases knowledge. One who does not study is liable for death. Um, probably an exaggeration, but the term used is actually the rabbinic term that means legal liability. Um, one who misuses the crown of learning shall die, right? So there are all of these different ethical statements about your behavior and about learning as well. Um, Mishnah Pe'ah, so this is, this section of the Mishnah has no Gemara, so it's not really part of the Talmud, it's just the Mishnah. Um, and it says, these are the things that have no definite quantity, no fixed quantity. The corners of the field, first fruits, the offerings on appearing at the temple for pilgrimages, the performance of righteous deeds, the study of the Torah. The following are the things you enjoy fruits in this world. So you accumulate the, you enjoy the interest earned on the principal in this world and then cash in the, on the principal in the next, according to this statement honoring one's father and mother, performing righteous deeds, making peace between a person and his friend, and the study of the Torah is equal to them all. Um, there's a lot to be said about exactly how you translate this equal to them all thing, but you have this idea that study is key to ethics. And that as well carries on into talking about modern, the, the Musar movement that we'll really be spending time with over the next few weeks. Um, Duties of the Heart, that first ethical text that I talked about, dates to the 11th century. Um, and the things which spoil the pure devotion of all our acts to God are three in number. The first is ignorance of God and his graces. The second, ignorance of his commandments. The third is temptation of the instinct to do evil and its advice to man which makes him fall in love with this world, pushing him away from the path to the hereafter. So again, we have this idea of fear of the Lord, um, carrying through as essential to ethics. Um, a couple of chunks from Jewish ethical wills. There's actually a, a two volume set that's now one gigantic book called Jewish Ethical Wills, where you can look all of these up. Um, and some of it is very entertaining reading. So this one is Gates of Instruction, is falsely attributed to Maimonides and says, he who leads a good life finds good even in this world for they that see him glorify him and those who know him declare him blessed. So the idea that if, you're, if you do good things and you're a good person, you'll benefit in this world, not because there's sunshine that's going to come down from heaven and reward you for being a good person, but because people will recognize it in you and treat you well. Um, the ethical will of Judah Ibn Tibbon to his son, Samuel Ibn Tibbon. For those who joined us for the Maimonides stuff, Samuel Ibn Tibbon translated Maimonides into Hebrew. And we mentioned a letter that he wrote to Maimonides saying, I'd really like to come visit you. And Maimonides wrote back and said, I'm so busy. Here's how busy I am. I work all day, I take care of the Sultan's family, and then I have to take care of people at the synagogue, and so don't bother visiting me. This is the same guy, Samuel Ibn Tibbon. This is the ethical will his father wrote for him. 
And we have a few things because this is one of the more entertaining ethical wills. My son, make thy books thy companions. Let the cases and shelves be thy pleasure grounds and gardens. I should say this book uses very archaic translation. If thy, if thy should be satiate and weary, change from garden to garden, from furrow to furrow, from prospect to prospect. Read your books. You'll feel good if you read your books. It's good for you. Um, nor have you acquired sufficient skill in Hebrew writing, though I paid 30 golden pieces annually. Um, if ever there was a Jewish parental guilt thing in writing in the medieval period to show that nothing ever changes, it is this. I paid for Hebrew lessons for you, and you have not done well enough. I paid 30 pieces annually to this guy who taught you Hebrew, and he says, oh, you're barely going to be able to learn the alphabet. I am very disappointed in you. I think this was before he translated Maimonides into Hebrew. Um, and then there's all these little things that he gives as ethical advice in a poem. Forgive your friend, don't join foes, avoid disputes, don't take oaths. If you've loaned money, don't collect on it. Rely on God for compensation, right? So some of this stuff is straight out of Proverbs. And when you get to this section of the book, it actually kind of says, we didn't bother with the biblical references here. There's just too many. Um, the footnotes were too much. We didn't bother. Go read Proverbs. I mean, that's essentially what, what the book says for this. So, Jack, you've got a hand up. Uh, yeah, just to ask you to uh, maybe define a bit ethical will. I mean, is this uh, literally meant to be a kind of deathbed advice, or is this something that's prepared in advance? Uh, just uh, explain a little bit about the ethical will concept. Sure. So, ethical wills are mostly um, written in advance. They are intended to be um, the voice from beyond the grave telling people what to do as they get older. It's sort of formal parental advice. Um, sometimes it's just the, in the form of a letter. The ones that are tend to be collected and viewed of historical value are either attributed to or actually written by people who were particularly important historically or are simply really interesting pieces of literature. Um, so some people gave advice to the next generation in the form of poetry. And so the entire ethical will is actually a long poem. Um, frequently in meter that's derived from Arabic poetry, um, which is what we're seeing down here. This is this stuff is translated into English, but it's Hebrew follows a pattern of Arabic poetry. Um, so it's not connected to property inheritance, but it is a very formal way of saying, this is what I would like you to do moving forward. Um, we have, most of them are from men, surprise, surprise. Um, however, Gluckel of Hamelm, who was a, um, a Jewish woman living in the 1600s in Poland wrote her memoirs and wrote an ethical will. And we have her ethical will available and translated from Yiddish into English. So that's the basic concept of an ethical will is passing on not legal material, but here's how I would like you to live your life. Here's how you should live your life. Here are the mistakes I've made, sometimes mistakes. Not everybody admits to them. Um, Mesilat Yasharim, so I haven't mentioned this by name yet, um, but Mesilat Yasharim is one of the core texts used by the formal Musar movement, even though it predates it by about 100 years, and is largely an inspection of the various qualities of personality that affect one's ability to be a good person. So it has chapters on humility and on anger and on fear and on various emotional states. Um, so Ms. Sadat Yasharin, this is an example from it. And he's talking here about humility. And he says, another type of person exists who wants to be highly celebrated for his qualities it's not enough that the whole world praises him. He wants to be praised for being humble, which makes him super, super arrogant, obviously. 
in um, in Lutzato. This is written by um, Moshe Chaim Lutzato. Um, arrogant people are people who, in part, want to be viewed as humble, and Though haughty people of this nature pass themselves off as being humble, this doesn't reduce the obstacles before them. They're still bad people, is what he's saying. Um, they have personality qualities that are not humble, even though they think they're being humble. Um, the Tanya, this is a text that's central for Chabad Hasidism, um, talks about um, here the idea that it's only enthusiasm, a joy in a receptive heart that keeps you free from worry in the world, that keeps you moving forward with your ethical goals. Um, the Tanya is another heavily psychological work. Um, there was a tendency in the, in the mid to late 1700s for people influenced by Jewish mysticism to try to apply some of those ideas to human psychology though we wouldn't call them psychologists in the modern sense, right? They're trying to understand the characteristics of the soul in a kind of more practical, this is what you're like kind of way. Um, so I'm going to just quickly divide us into two groups for a discussion. And the discussion that I'd like you to have in your rooms is having looked at these things pretty quickly, what are the things that you're seeing in them that are in common? What are the things you're seeing in them that are different? And what are you not seeing that's characteristic of traditional Jewish practice? What did we not talk about at all in these texts? Um, so I think, Larry, I think you have to make me the host for me to be able to do this. Okay. So I think if you go to the, yeah, there we go. Uh, I guess the ethical thing to do is give it up, but. Well, sure. <laughs> it, um, we could debate that actually, but <laughs> we, we won't debate that. It would fall under humility. Um, and I'll explain why when we talk about humility. Um, humble. But what I'm going to do is split us into two and I will see everybody in about five minutes. We don't want to spend too much time on this. I just really want you to think about what the commonalities were among these things and what was missing. So I've lost my mouse. Here we go.
we go we got we got cut in the middle of a conversation. <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, um, it's okay. I should have mentioned before we went into the breakout rooms that the breakout rooms are not part of the recording. Um, okay. There's absolutely no recording in the breakout room, um, just because I'm not in any of the breakout rooms, right? So, so what did you, what if anything? did you come up with as things that those texts talked about and things that those texts didn't talk about? Uh, this is Jack. We seem to be in agreement in our group that the texts that you showed us anyway, um, in terms of their um, what ethical scope, seem to be focused more, much more on interpersonal relations than on what we might call social justice considerations. Mm -hmm. What I noticed, and I mentioned it, is that, you know, that uh, behavior is one thing, but first of all, you have to believe in God. Bef be without the believing in God, you know, none of it really counts. Well, although there, what I noticed, there weren't a lot of specifics on rituals that you had to do. It was more focused on be a good person as opposed to kiss the mezuzah or whatever. Right. Yeah, so let's talk about some of that for a second. Um, if you look at what we, if you look at those texts, you discover that there's not a lot of specifics, right? So Joyce, you mentioned there's nothing that says kiss a mezuzah or has any specific kind of practice to it but there's actually not a whole lot of direct advice. You get occasional things of, oh, chase after wisdom. Okay, uh, what does that look like? Um, read books more often, and would you please work on your Hebrew more closely? Um, all right, what does that mean? Study Torah. Okay, that's a instruction, but kind of vague, and, and it's made equivalent with all this other stuff. Um, there's not a ton of specifics. There's not a lot of like actual content to put your hands around. Um, is any of this stuff specifically Jewish? I mean, you could talk about the God stuff as being Jewish, but mm, everybody kind of has that, right? I mean, lots of cultures have that. I'm not aware uh, of the emphasis on learning and studying in other religions. Um, Islam would be very, very surprised to hear you say that because there is a, a comparable study culture in Islam, for sure. Uh, Roberto, you have a, a hand up, I think. Um. Right. So, so yeah, not only Islam, I think a lot of religions, uh, I know uh, Hinduism and Buddhism, they have like the different path. There is the path of wisdom, which is about dedicating your life to study. So I think that's, that's also common to other religions. But what, what I was going to, to comment is, um, which I think I, on our um, close separate group, I also made that uh, this is still a very small sample, right? Uh, that's what I was right. kind of going to ask you because, again, if you good look at the, the, the Talmud as a source of law, I mean, you're going to find, maybe not on this particular sample, but very, very detailed about how people should live their lives. So I would translate that into some ethics fundamentals, right? At least intrinsic to those uh, guidance for how people should live their lives, right? I think there is um, uh, a lot of that and, and very specific things about what people do. So I, I don't know if I would totally agree with, you know, like on a broader term, um, you know, beside this particular sample. And I think you probably find all kinds of things, right, throughout history. But I think there's, in Jewish law, there is a lot of specifics that speak to the ethics. Uh, if that's uniquely Jewish, that's a different discussion, right? Uh, this whole thing of, uh, and we were also talking about the don't treat the other the way you don't want to be treated or the other right. way around. Uh, I mean, that's again, kind of 
it's almost like a cliche for every, right? <laughs> the golden rule or whatever, but Jews try to treat that, tend to treat this thing as a Jewish thing. So it's very hard to say what is Jewish, but I think there is a lot of specific, uh, I don't know if I'm missing that. No, you, no yeah. what you're saying makes sense. And we'll actually talk about that momentarily. Uh, Barry, you've got a virtual hand. Yes. Um, the, the thing that I like to focus on is, is it Jewish? Not is it uniquely Jewish? And I think it's a trap that we could fall into worrying about, oh, are we the only ones who do this? Uh, I think it would just better off to say, yes, we do this, and this is something which is worthwhile doing. Okay. Um, so I'd like to kind of actually talk a little bit, it'll touch a little bit on what you said, Barry, but it will definitely touch, Roberto, on what you've pointed out. There is a view that says there's no such thing as Jewish ethics. There is a view that says, we have halakha. What's this nonsense about Jewish ethics? Ethics is the Judaism of the assimilated. Ethics isn't a question if you have halakha. The Talmud has all kinds of things to tell you what to do and when to do those things. And the legal codes have them. There's no such thing as Jewish ethics. There's rules. And the rules tell you what to do. And ethics is secular. Ethics is for people who don't have religious rules to follow. Or maybe ethics is Christian and secular or something like that. This is, this is Michael Wishagrod's approach. He was a, a Orthodox Jewish theologian in the 80s and 90s. Um, Alan Middleman is a professor at Jewish Theological Seminary who wrote a book called The Short History of Jewish Ethics. And responding directly to Wishagrod's take, he says, rather than treating these concepts as timeless extensions, we should treat them as related. Law and ethics hang together, particularly defining the domain of the other in a fluid culture bound way, <clears throat> which is a really, really, really fancy way of saying there is such a thing as Jewish ethics. It is separate but entwined with the idea of Jewish law. One defines the other in broad contour. And what happens in any given generation and in any specific physical context, right? Your Italian Jewish culture of the 1500s versus Eastern European Jewish culture of the mid 1800s will define each other. Culture plays a role, right? He, he's a teacher at Jewish Theological Seminary. He's not going to say that Jewish ethics was handed down from heaven exactly, um, but he is saying there is some kind of a difference. And the difference that he connects up with is the ethical disciplines and the movement of Musar. And he says, look, there's this word Musar. He uses one S, it's fine. Um, signifies chastening discipline or exhortation, giving rise to a movement in the 19th century, concerned with what we would call moral psychology, motivation, akrasia. Um, Acrasia means roughly uh, unrulidness, um, attention and inattention, attitude, indecision, focus and distraction. It is the Jewish equivalent in broad terms of the study of virtue. And he points to um, duties of the heart, which we talked about earlier. I'm probably just going to call it chavot halavavot because it's weird to say duties of the heart to me given prior education on my end. Um, and in that book, there's a distinction between duties of the limbs, the law, and duties of the heart or virtue. The, char the personal characteristics that make for not just following halakha, but the personal dispositions for following rules and for treating other people well, even when it's totally outside the bounds of halakha. Because there is a recognition through Jewish history that you can follow all of the rules and keep the commandments 
and still be a horrible human being. Um, and so Middleman's point is, there is a separate discipline of Jewish ethics. And the point is to develop the predispositions and the psychology and the motivation and the willingness and the whatever else to not just following the rules, but that's part of it in the traditional context, but just being a more virtuous person. That halacha is about the specific knowable tasks you must do, not all of which have ethical content. That ethics is in some ways its own thing and that Jewish ethical literature is about personal virtues more than about the specific obligations you have. So that's kind of Middleman's take on it and it's how he's salvaging the idea of Jewish ethics. And then, you know, we can ask, well, what makes that Jewish? Did Jewish people do it, I guess that makes it Jewish. Um, he's just gonna identify all of this stuff by literary genre and who generates the material. Um, so we've said that Musar is correction, whatever else, and why does Middleman talk specifically about Musar as his, this is in the introduction to the book, he already kind of lays out the, there is such a thing as Jewish ethics and you can tell from Musar. Um, so what is that even? Um, and so Musar exists in two forms. It's a body of literature. They're not all tightly connected to each other. It's not a genre of literature. It's a big body of literature about ethics, about personal dispositions. Um, Musar as literature goes all the way back in some ways to Proverbs, right? We saw stuff that was, there's no commandment that says, keep seeking after divine beauty, but you're supposed to do it according to Proverbs. Seek after wisdom. There is no commandment in the Torah that says, seek wisdom. Proverbs says you have to do it to be an effective person. Um, Musar as a movement dates to the early, really mid 1800s and has a set of views on how you do the work of being an ethical person. And those tools work pretty well in secular and religious contexts in Jewish and in non-Jewish contexts because they're tools that are built on some philosophical insights and they're usable for us once you start to peel away at what's happening with those tools. So we'll talk a lot more about Musar as a movement today and the tools it provides as sort of setting the stage for what's going to come in the next few weeks and in terms of how to think about getting ready for the things that the high holidays are about for humanistic Jews, which is taking an assessment of the prior year and restoring relationships and making meaningful resolutions as opposed to the I'm going to watch less TV resolution that sometimes happens on um, December 31st at the end of each secular year. So Musar as a movement is from Eastern European yeshivas. Um, founded by Rabbi Israel Salanter. Um, Israel Salanter is like one step away from the point in time when Jews didn't have last names. Um, his last name is Salanter because he's from the town of Salant. That's it. Um, in the 1840s, 1850s, Salant is in Lithuania. Um, and he was kind of known for having a practical orientation. He is dismissive of Kabbalah and mysticism and of Maimonides style rationalism. And in one of his letters, we have him saying, Luzado's work on the Kabbalah, so this is the person who wrote Misilat Yesharim that we looked at earlier. One of the quintessential works of Musar that Salanter and others will rely on, he says, all that Kabbalah stuff, I don't care. I don't study the subject. I don't know if the time is ripe. 
you know, our job is to be good people. And I don't see how studying the emanations of the spheres and which of the seven heavens does God live in, none of that stuff seemed important to him. So he just didn't worry about it, was much more pragmatically oriented. And um, so Emmanuel Etkes is kind of the major biographer for him. And Etkes says he has theosophical apathy. He just doesn't care. It's not all that important. Um, Salanter's view of Musar was psychological. So all of these prior works thought that the way to become a better person was if we just told you the concepts, you would get it and you would act on it. Um, Salanter says that's not working because he was a yeshiva teacher and he had students and he had relatives who were involved in the business world and in other matters. And he saw that in fact, they could read Torah all day and still be horrible people when they left the yeshiva. And so he said, okay, there's a problem. And so his focus was on bridging that gap. How do we get from the, I know the things I'm supposed to do and actually developing the ability to do them. Um, and he says, this is hard work, right? This goal of entering the inner chamber is possible only after much labor and effort in subduing one's impulse to do evil and in hard work to withstand the vicissitudes of the world and the troubles of time and all of one's days, one is in danger of being doomed by the net of the impulse which is spread before one's feet every day and every hour, right? This is a dark view of the world, but it's also a somewhat realistic view. There are all kinds of things coming into our path and simply knowing what to do is not good enough. We all know what to do. That's not the problem. How do you do it? He was focused on that piece of it as opposed to trying to identify specific ethical obligations because he thought, well, we're teaching people that in yeshiva and we can do that, but we can't get them to be the kind of people we think they ought to be. And that's our job, he thought, was teaching them how to be what they should be. Um, and Ekis kind of points out, so his theosophic apathy meant that he ignored most of medieval Jewish literature outside of commentaries on the Talmud. So he actually, in essence, the things he cared about were rewound to the ancient period. And when you rewind to the ancient period, you see that both the book of Proverbs and rabbinic texts, so the Talmud and things like that, tend to a kind of moderation um, that is very much like Greek Stoicism. Um, there's been a lot of writing connecting the rabbis and the Stoics it's probably not right to say that the rabbis were Stoics, but there's a lot there of approaches to moderation and approaches to um, being emotionally contained in your dispositions and whatever else that reflects that kind of Stoic approach. Um, and Musar as a, as a movement will adopt that approach too. It will eventually come around to say, there are all of these characteristics that we can work on. And the thing about these characteristics is that you shouldn't be too much one way or the other in the scope of that character trait, that there's a, a place to be and it's kind of a happy medium in most of those characteristics for people. So in talking about humility, Musar literature says, okay, look, humility doesn't mean you absolutely debase yourself. It also doesn't mean that you're an egotistical jerk, there's a place to be that's in the middle where you're taking up your proper place in the world. And that's what's important about humility. That's actual humility, as opposed to self-abasement or self-aggrandizement, right? So you can see already just talking about that concept that the way we use the word humility is not quite the way Musar is gonna use humility. And it does that with almost every character trait. Um, Salanter's method of teaching in the yeshiva ended up with creation of a Musar house at the yeshiva. So students would go to regular Talmud yeshiva study lessons for one part of the day. And then the second half of the day, they go to the Musar house and they study Musar texts in partnership 
and in isolation and figure out the character traits they need to work on and meditate on those character traits and say affirmations and all kinds of other things to build those traits up. Um, and the movement itself grows into a network of yeshivas led by his students. Um, different focuses, some focused on meditation, some were focused on really academic study. They all kind of had different dispositions. So this is Musar as a movement, how it grows. Um, and his ultimate innovation was connecting practices to concepts. So Salanter didn't write books himself. We have some letters, but he wasn't a scholar. He wasn't, he was a scholar, but he wasn't a, um, he wasn't somebody who produced systems and literature. He was somebody who took existing systems and found ways to tie them together. Um, and so he grabs from pre-existing works, the concepts for personal characteristics that you work on and the tools that you use to do the work. And so Salanter's view of the way this all works is everybody has personality characteristics that they need to improve. And we have all these tools that if you use them will help you do that. And when you take that in isolation, it doesn't seem terribly specifically religious. Salanter thinks that the whole point of this is fear of God. Later students will talk about this, but will actually not focus on it. Um, so Musar is not as shaped by Salanter's idea that you should be afraid of God all the time so much as it is by the tools and his assembling of existing things into a new system. Um, and there are kind of three major pieces to the how you do Musar system. So there's Hitbo Dedut, which is solitude. You take some time to yourself, visualize moving through the world according to principles, meditate on these ideas. Hit pa'alut, which is chanting and repetition to internalize principles and then journaling. So you journal at the beginning of the day or maybe at the end of the day to kind of take stock of how you did and to think about how you're going to move through the day. And if this is starting to sound like the Franklin Covey planner system or some other day planner system, there's a reason for that. And we're going to get to the reason very soon. Um, the movement is very, very modern. Even though it comes out of yeshivas in the mid 1800s, it's really, really, really modern. Cheshbon Hanefesh, the concept is self-accounting, accounting for oneself. It's derived from a book, Sefer Cheshbon Hanefesh, written by Menachem Mendel Leffen, who was a rabbi, but he was also a maskil. So he was an advocate of the Jewish enlightenment in Poland. Um, his day job was educating the children of the major Polish prince of his time. So he was in the business of educating non-Jewish children. So he had to have broad secular learning. He is known to have encountered and studied with Moses Mendelssohn in Berlin. So we're not talking about a, we're not talking about somebody who stayed in the yeshiva his whole life very much a modern sort of person. Um, his book reads like Benjamin Franklin's works on solitude and reflection, specifically in Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. Um, and despite the fact that he was essentially not an orthodox kind of guy, Salanter, who was a very orthodox guy, was the person responsible for this book being published in Lithuania. Without Salanter intervening, this book never gets published and never becomes accessible to the yeshiva world. Salanter's focus on controlling inclination toward evil is something that he gets from another yeshiva genius. So this is not something that's new to him. Um, and the yeshiva genius who comes up with this, the Vilna Gaon, 
himself is known to have studied modern science and, and mathematics of his time. So notebooks exist that show him doing calculus. Um, so these are very modern minded people, even if they're very orthodox people. So Musar is then very modern in its outlook as well, particularly for its time. He reworked yeshivas. So a lot of yeshivas did actually no ethical education at all. They just taught people Torah. And his approach reworked yeshivas, created Musar style yeshivas, so that by the late 1890s, there are students at yeshivas who actually want Musar out of their lives because they feel like they're being bullied or told, being told what to do and it's intrusive. And so instead, just get Musar out. We just want to study Talmud all the time. Musar is not important, right? So this, this argument that Michael Wishergrad we talked about earlier, there's no such thing as Jewish ethics. There's halacha has been a part of the Musar scene since there was Musar to talk about. There is a contemporary Musar movement that exists outside of the yeshivas. Um, and that's really started in the 1970s a little bit, but really in the 80s and 90s, picked up steam, much like the sort of separated from traditional context study of Kabbalah did. Um, and it has three major advocates. So Ira Stone, who's Rabbi Emeritus and was a professor of philosophy, founded the Center for Contemporary Musar. Alan Morinis is an anthropologist and a Rhodes Scholar and had a huge personal and career crisis. He was a professor of anthropology and then he started a film production company and then the company failed and he had to reckon with himself and he discovered Musar in that process. And then Greg Marcus, who's a former Silicon Valley guy who studied with Alan Morinis and said, I'm gonna open my own Musar thing. Um, so these are kind of the three big advocates for Musar in the modern world. And they, the extent to which they are closely engaged with tradition, Ira Stone is much more engaged with tradition, Morinis a little bit less so, Greg Marcus less so still. Uh, but they are all engaging with the Musar method and Musar texts without tying them as tightly to the idea of fear of God or following halacha. But that's not their thing. Their thing is, here's this Jewish tool that we think can rework your life. That's their general approach. Um, with more traditional focus on this end and le much less traditional focus on this end. So I've talked a lot about Musar, but how do you do it? So how you do it, we can find actually in this Sefer Cheshbon HaNefesh, and it says to start with, you should get yourself a notebook. Get yourself 13 things that you need to work on, 13 characteristics that you need to work on according to your needs to fix your negative attributes. You should write out an attention, a kavana, which is a what's the thing I need to think about to make myself better on this axis of my personality. And you review them one each week and you repeat this cycle four times in the year. 13 times four gets you 52, 52 weeks in a year until they're habitually in your mouth so that when you think about the concept of humility, whatever your focus sentence is for humility, it's in your head and you can just recite it. And from that day forward, you just need to see a reminder of the concept and it's inscribed in your heart. And so you can see it written clearly in your eyelids when you close your eyes, you can hear them being whispered in your ears as though you can recite it by rote. So get so familiar with the meditation part that when somebody says humility, the affirmation comes out. He gives a list of 18 traits. So half of the book is talking about how to set up this notebook and the other half of the book are explaining the traits. Um, orderliness, deliberation, patience, right action, equanimity, moderation. And again, 
these terms don't clearly define into the English language terms as we usually use them. Um, decisiveness, trust, cleanliness, right? All of these seemingly positive values. The modern Musar world usually starts with humility because they think an awful lot of what's wrong with modern people is we lack the proper understanding of our place in the grand scheme of things. Um, so you pick focuses, you pick 13 foci out of this and you work on those 13 things for the year. And he says, for this matter, you put together a single small notebook with nine sheets so that you get 18 pages, right, fold it up, 13 pages for 13 attributes. Top of each page, you write a single trait and the affirmation, and then you put a table down below, 13 rows high by seven rows wide, and you can fill it in with a quill and you just mark X's or whatever to tell you when you've failed on that day with regard to all 13 attributes. And you only really focus in a given week on the one thing that you're working on that week. And you just kind of keep track of everything else to see how you're doing. Where did this stuff come from? Ben Franklin. No kidding. This is Ben Franklin's autobiography. This is an actual example of Benjamin Franklin's chart. The week that he was going to work on temperance, this was his affirmation. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And these are just the first letter of each of those personality traits that Franklin identified as ones that he needed to work on. And he actually characterizes this program as the path to moral perfection. As in, I needed to find moral perfection, so I started doing this. And he says, and actually I only had 12, but then one of my friends pointed out to me that I'm not very humble, and so I added humility to the list. Here's what's in Sefer Cheshbon HaNefesh. So this is uh, the week for equanimity. These are all of the character traits that the person is working on for the year. Monday, well actually Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 13 rows. 13 rows. So the author of Cheshbon HaNefesh read Franklin's autobiography and said, wow, this tool could work for us. And here's his example page. So I actually grabbed this out of a facsimile copy of Sefer Cheshbon HaNefesh that was printed in Lithuania in 1936, I think. So this is right out of the book. They have different lists of character traits, but they're not that different. So all of these, these are Ben Franklin's traits. These are Leffen's traits. And you can see there's only one trait Franklin talked about that didn't show up in here. There are some traits that Leffen identified that don't show up exactly in the list. But you can see there's a very close correspondence between what Franklin came up with and what Leffen suggested people do. Um, this, has this has caused some scholars to say that in fact, Leffen just plagiarized Franklin. He didn't exactly plagiarize Franklin. He wrote a lot more than Ben Franklin did on this issue. Um, the translation of Sefer Cheshbon HaNefesh that Leffen wrote is like 400 pages long. Ben Franklin's autobiography dedicates 10 pages to this. So it's not, it's a more in-depth kind of treatment. But you can see we're working with the same basic idea. Keep a notebook, track your, your failings, 
go through it every week to figure out how you're doing. You make four, psych, four more pages and then you kind of use those pages as summary pages. So you transfer everything over. And then the last table summarizes for the year so that you can kind of get a sense for how well did I do this year? How many times did I fail with this trade or that trade or the other? Every morning you read aloud the traits affirmation, pause for a moment to think about how to apply it. And after this, search your thoughts. What kinds of things do I have to do today? Are they heavenly matters or worldly matters? How do I arrange my day to do them the right way and in the right order and at the right time? And I should be, you should be persistent about doing them in the right order and follow this prescription every day. The thing I'm telling you to do, do every day. This is incidentally what Ben, Frank, ben Franklin said he tried to do every day. And each night before bed, review your day, examine it, mark everything down in your journal to tell you where you did well or not. And then after he tells you how to do this, the next half of the book is actually on his 18 character traits. So this is sort of the overall way that Musar works um, is kind of deliberation over the things that you need to do better, practical tracking of it, journaling, a little bit of meditation, and trying to be honest about successes and failures. And the idea is by focusing on this and going through this cycle, you get to be a better person who's more able to follow through on what eventually becomes the key aspect of Musar, which is bearing the burden of the other person in your relationships. So that's where this all goes. Uh, Roberto, you've got a virtual hand up. Maybe you have an actual hand, but I can't see you in the photo. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so so um, I think that um, so, so I, in the beginning we were talking about uh, about the Musar movement, and I thought that they were kind of tend to be originalists, right? They are trying to go to the original text. So I'm not sure that I understand how is that fitting with this whole. Is almost like creating a system out that has nothing to do with anything that they were trying to do before, right? Right. So. Salanter wants to rewind in some respects, but Salanter's interest in rewinding is a practically focused one, right? So his interest in rewinding is not, oh, all this medieval stuff is terrible and I shouldn't bother with it. He doesn't think that Kabbalah is wrong, but from a getting through the world perspective, he doesn't see its value. And rewinding back to the rabbinic period is a way of rewinding back to a particular view of moderation of character. Um, because Jewish mysticism focuses on a weird combination of asceticism and um, indulgence in um, sensation. It's a very strange package, whereas the earlier rabbinic stuff is very focused on a middle way. And he thinks the middle way is really important in being able to be a good person in the world. And that carries through to these concepts that he then pulls from other people to create this set of practices. Jack, you got a hand up. Um, uh, Leffen's uh, 18 character traits or virtues, mm -hmm. um, does he, uh, source those to rabbinic sources or the Tanakh? Is there a justification for why these? I mean, they seem reasonably comprehensive, but on the other hand, I bet one could think of, you know, 30 or 40 uh, human virtues. So why these 18? Uh, these 18, he does trace them back to rabbinic texts. One section of um, Sefer Cheshbon HaNefesh actually is a collection of the verses from Proverbs that he relies on um, and the little phrases from Proverbs that he relies on. And it turns out to be hundreds of lines long. 
and he's taking those, taking these concepts and tying them back to Proverbs. Um, as you move forward in time through Musar, what the subsequent Musar folks do is they don't do much to Leffen's practical system. They instead start to explore all of these character traits and personality traits and perspectives and tease out so that people can start to understand what falls, what is, what does humility actually mean from a practical perspective? Um, how do I know what humility is? Because Leffen's not the last word on that. Um, and you do actually eventually get to a list of character traits that that's 30 or 40 things long because eventually they start to include negative ones. And the purpose of including the negative ones is taking something like anger and saying, okay, so the thing you want to work on is being angry. The way you deal with being angry is working on whatever the flip side positive thing for anger is for you. So anger for some people is um, feeling as though their level of importance is not recognized by others, which means that you need to work on humility, right? But Leffen doesn't talk about anger as a separate trait. Eventually the negative traits come in too. And the entire system becomes a view of personality as a sets of traits that can be balanced against one another, um, which actually has a very practical aspect to it. And none of it is specifically necessarily only Jewish um, to the extent that in his chapter on equanimity, um, Leffen actually talks about, I don't know what bird this is and I don't know what snake this is. I, I kind of have to say that up front, but he talks about that there is a particular snake in America and he uses the word America. There's a particular snake in America that chases a particular kind of bird. And what happens is the bird goes up to the top of the tree because it sees the snake and the snake is sitting there with its mouth open the whole time, waiting for this bird to basically have a panic attack. And so he compares people to this bird ready to have a panic attack and fall out of the tree and get caught by the snake. So there is some sort of talkless, you know, rubber to the road stuff to it. Um, but it eventually becomes an exercise in creating a balanced psychology without anybody talking about psychology in those terms. So they have this idea of shadow, which is a lot like Jung's idea of shadow, but they're not reading Jung. Right? So their stuff ties up pretty well, coming out of Jewish sources, but not really generating a product that is necessarily only Jewish. Um, so that's sort of the thrust to where Musar goes. And then Musar becomes an effective way of um, for a lot of people <clears throat> of finding some balance and being aware week by week by week by week of where they, where they feel they have character weaknesses and tracking those things and adjusting them. Um, and to be totally transparent about it, yes, I do this just in case anybody thought, what, you're, you're pitching this and what? Um, I actually do this. Um, I use a source with a longer list of these things, but this is actually something that I do. Um, although I can't say that I'm going to a Musar house for three hours a day and studying with other people, like I don't do it the yeshiva way, um, but it is actually a tool that I use how well it works. I think it works, but um, I don't know in every case. But that's the basic system. And it, it seems like a fairly straightforward kind of self-help thing, except that it doesn't promise that it's going to make your life better quickly or with no work. It is entirely a system of introspection and work 
And it's always about who you are now, not who you were, and not really even who you'll be. Um, which is what makes it a little, little bit different from other possible self-help kinds of things. Um, so that's kind of working through what these concepts are and um, talking about how to apply all of this is really where we would be headed over the next few weeks up to Rosh Hashanah, but not past Rosh Hashanah. Uh, let's see, there is a thing in the chat. Ah, the last work calls. Um, so questions, comments, concerns. If it's, if it's more or less interesting to you, um, Tara, our administrator, is going to be looking at how to tie this into meditation and yoga stuff that she teaches, has been a teacher of for a while as well. So there'll be different ways of engaging in this. It won't just be, let's read about what some guy from the 1800s thinks humility is. Are there any questions, comments? I'm me, your mic is open. Um, Jeremy, uh, yeah. does this to any substantial extent attract non-Jews? Yes. Um, it is not as attractive to non-Jews as Kabbalah because it doesn't promise magical fixes, which Kabbalah very much does, or modern Kabbalah very much does. Um, but it does in fact attract people who are not Jewish because it is a disciplined system and it does have ties into religious ideas that are attractive to people who aren't Jewish. Um, Ami, you have your microphone open. Did you have a? No. I... No, okay. Um, and then Laura, I, was, I saw you. I was getting hand. ready to say thank you, that's all. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Laura, and then Jack. Um, yeah, so uh, the question I had is, um, I mean, that, does it work to do this all by yourself or at some point do you need um, to check with someone? Um, it does work to do it all by yourself. Um, a big chunk of this is actually built on the idea that only you know what you need to work on. Only you can do the work of working on it. And much of the work is done alone. Um, there is room for where, where study comes into play in Musar is in studying all of these different traits and seeing how they, um, how they change and how they can manifest and what examples of them are and possible mental approaches to dealing with one or another difficulty that somebody has. But the work is work that really can only be done in an individual way. So there is some role for consulting with other people, but it's work done primarily alone. Jack. I take it the Musar process involves not only exploring or explicating these uh, traits, but also attempting to explore the interrelationship. That is to say, the potential conflict, for example, between patience and decisiveness. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's, wow, that's like the easiest question. I, so it's not the easiest question, but it is the easiest answer. Yes. Um, all of these things are held as having to be in balance. Um, and it requires constant work. So part of the, part of the understanding of Musar as a, as a system is we are all constantly changing in response to our environments and in response to our different personality traits and our underlying makeup. Um, 
in a very traditional Musar setting, they would say everybody's soul traits are different and everybody's soul manifests in different ways. But we all have different psychologies and we all have different brain chemistry. And at any given point in time, all of these things will be balanced differently for everybody. Um, it's sometimes referred to as a curriculum. It's an individual curriculum. It's your curriculum and nobody else's. Um, and all of these things do end up being balanced against each other. So humility and equanimity are somewhat tied together and deliberation and patience are tied together and truthfulness, right? So all of these things tie up and it is part of a, a larger working on the whole person and the picking 13 traits and doing one a week and going through a cycle of four in a year is intended to be able to hit multiple of these areas in a way that helps people focus on them, change them and balance them out as they change over time. And the idea is kind of gradual iterative progression toward being better, understanding no one is perfect. Other questions? Laura, I don't know if your hand is up for real or if your hand is up from before. Oh, no, sorry. I oh, forgot. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's see. There's another message in the chat. Um, okay. Um, if people have questions, feel free to let me know. Um, the next three sessions of this will be sort of focusing on these, these character traits and approaches and thinking about how they might apply in the run up to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, and then Tara and I will be, will be coordinating on the, um, some of the more rubber meets the road practical aspects of it for those who are interested. All right, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.